Leverage is an interesting thing. It can help us to greatly magnify our returns when our investments are on the rise, but it will also magnify our losses when our investments fall. In many cases, there's also a risk of losing more money than we actually put into an investment when that investment utilizes leverage. Take real estate, for example. If you put 20% down on a $300,000 home, you will have a mortgage of around $240,000. If, over the course of the next year, the neighborhood in which that home sits goes downhill and the home loses value, say 30% of its value, which is unbelievably extreme, especially for real estate, but it'll illustrate the point, then you would owe more on your home than you could get from selling it. This is known as being underwater on a home, and it's a terrible position to be in, but it is a risk that many leveraged investing strategies present, and it needs to be taken into consideration. But not all leveraging strategies present that particular risk to individual investors. Options, for instance, can be utilized in much the same way as insurance premiums are. If you exercise an option, you can multiply your returns when compared to a version of yourself who invested directly in the funds you bought the option for. But you can also buy an option and decide not to exercise it, and walk away having lost no more money than whatever you spent to buy the option in the first place. So what if there was a way to leverage the returns of an investment that we're pretty sure will rise over the long haul without being tied to the potential extra payments like we just mentioned with real estate? Say something like the S&P 500, which has certainly had its ups and downs, and some of them were pretty drastic, but on the whole, when you look over the long term, its trend is usually upward. Well, as it turns out, we actually can do that by investing in something called a leveraged ETF. But is it actually a good idea? As you can no doubt tell from the title of this video, that's the question we're going to be attempting to answer for ourselves today. Let's talk about leveraged ETFs, what they are, how they work, and some things to consider when looking at whether or not they'd make for good long-term investments. But before we get going, be sure to like this video if you haven't already, as it really does help out the channel a lot, and subscribe with notifications on for more money-related videos like this one every single week. And if you want to further support this channel, you can check out some of the links I've left in the description below, which includes a link to the investing platform M1 Finance. Get started investing for free today. So what are leveraged ETFs? A leveraged ETF is simply an ETF that tracks a specific fund and seeks to produce the returns of that fund multiplied by some number over a specific period of time, before things like expenses and fees are taken into account. The most common funds that are tracked are index funds for everything from stocks to bonds to commodities and even currencies. Normally, the leveraged ETF tries to achieve their return goals on a daily basis. So for example, the SSO is a leveraged ETF that tracks the S&P 500 index. It seeks to produce double the returns of the S&P 500 on a daily basis before expenses and fees are taken into account. It usually does this by investing in derivatives such as options and swaps to get that necessary level of exposure to the index to meet their daily return goals. But they still do often put some of the money towards actual stocks that make up the index. On the one hand, this is nice for us as individual investors because leveraged ETFs allow us to magnify our gains, or losses as the case may be, through the use of leverage without having to put ourselves at additional risk of losing more money than we put into the investment, as would be the case if we traded on margin or utilized some other similar strategy. But when asking if leveraged ETFs are a good long-term investment, as we are in this video, there are a few other things that need to be taken into consideration. As far as I can tell, the main questions that anyone should be asking themselves when trying to determine determine if leveraged ETFs are going to be a worthwhile investment for them fall under a few categories. First is the difference in costs between leveraged and non-leveraged funds. Second is the investor's situation, including their individual risk tolerance, their time horizon, and their investing goals. And third is, of course, the historical performance of leveraged investments compared to their unleveraged counterparts. Let's start by examining some of the common cost differences between leveraged and unleveraged funds. As you can imagine, a fund that seeks to meet a specific return goal every single day, as many leveraged funds do, is going to be, by its very nature, more active and generally more costly than the passive index fund that it's actually tracking. The additional costs come in a few different forms. There are the expense ratios and the fees of the fund, obviously, but then there are also some more hidden costs. Most of these ETFs effectively reset every single day, rebalancing their portfolios to get ready for the next opening bell. This can be a hindrance, though not necessarily a deal breaker, to any long-term buy and hold trader who keeps their money in a leveraged ETF, due to the mathematical phenomenon known as volatility drag. Volatility drag refers to the gap between arithmetic and compounded returns. For instance, say John had $100 invested in a regular, unleveraged S&P 500 index fund. On the first day, his investment gains 10% and grows to $110. 
On the second day, it loses 10%, but it doesn't actually fall back down to the original $100. Due to the effect of compounding, it actually loses 10% of $110, or $11 in total, and ends up falling to a value of $99. So even though John's investment rose and fell by the exact same amount on both days, he actually technically lost money. That is volatility drag, and it happens with basically every investment that compounds over time, including the ones that aren't leveraged. However, the difference becomes more pronounced when you do add leverage to the returns. Say John instead invested his $100 into a leveraged fund that seeks to produce three times the return of the S&P 500. Assuming that there were no tracking errors or other expenses or fees to worry about, John's investment would grow by 30% on day one and fall by 30% on day two. In the end, his nest egg would be worth $91. I know that doesn't sound like a big deal since we're only talking about $100 here, but add a few zeros onto the end of each of these figures, like what we might see in a retirement nest egg, and the difference becomes pretty eye-popping pretty quickly, especially over longer time periods, even if those daily ups and downs of the market were smaller than our hypothetical 10%, which they almost certainly would be. Tracking errors also happen from time to time. Nobody's perfect and leveraged funds are no different. Sometimes they run into issues where for one reason or another, they can't get into or out of positions fast enough to hit their return targets before the final bell sounds for the day. This happens to unleveraged funds from time to time as well, of course, but there's generally a little bit more risk to it happening with a leveraged fund simply because they're trading in more types of investments and in more markets. In any case, while it is a more minor concern, it does lead to occasional days that are slightly more volatile than we would actually expect in a perfect world, and as a result, they can exacerbate the effect of volatility drag over time. Though again, not nearly to the degree that the actual volatility of the index it tracks does. Again, this is more of a minor concern. Beyond volatility drag, expenses, and fees, there may be some other additional trading costs to consider. Leveraged funds tend to be traded less often than their unlevered counterparts because they're comparatively more of a niche product that isn't right for everybody. As a result, there may sometimes be wider bid-ask spreads than you'd see on an unleveraged fund, though obviously this is more pronounced in some funds than others. There's also the cost of the fund itself to invest in some of the derivatives. These costs aren't part of the overall expense ratio listed on the fund's prospectus, but they do eat into the overall returns generated by the fund. And finally, there can also be some tax implications to consider if you're investing in some sort of taxable account as leveraged funds don't tend to be considered as tax efficient as your typical index fund ETF. But that's a whole topic in and of itself. For more information, consult a tax professional. The second category involves your own personal situation as an investor. Within this category are things like your tolerance for risk, your time horizon, and your goals for the investment you're making. First, let's discuss risk tolerance. I'm sure most of you who are watching this video already know what risk tolerance refers to in investing, but leveraged ETFs can be a challenging hurdle to overcome even by some of the most steely of investors, if they're investing in them for the long term. Just to put some numbers to it to give you an idea of how volatile these investments can be, let's assume that John was investing in a leveraged ETF that tracks the S&P 500 and aimed to double its returns on a daily basis. If we assume that there were no tracking errors or other differences between the leveraged ETF and the index, here are some of the highs and lows John would have experienced if he had been investing since 1928. On March 15, 1933, he would have experienced his largest single-day gain of 33.2%. On October 19, 1987, he would have experienced his worst single-day loss of about 40.9%. His average rolling one-year return, before expenses, fees, taxes, and dividends are taken into consideration anyway, would have been a little over 15% per year from 1928 through the end of September 2020, which is the most recent completed month I have available to me at the time of this recording. But there was very little consistency to be found in those numbers. His best single-year return was 453% starting in July 1932. This followed his worst single-year return of negative 93%, which began in July 1931. The standard deviations of John's yearly returns was about 42%, which is an incredibly wide range compared to even your typical stock market investment, let alone a more balanced and diversified portfolio. And it was actually more than double that of the S&P 500 index during that same time frame, which had a standard deviation of about 20%. And as we expand the time frame that we're looking at, even those average returns start to peter off due in part to that leverage exacerbated volatility drag that we discussed earlier. The average rolling 3, 5, 10, 20, and 40 year returns would have been 11%, 10.7%, 10.5%, 11.6%, 11.8%. And 11.5% respectively. But those average returns can be a bit misleading. As we know, some years, and even some decades, 
are better for investments than others. In the stock market, the 1990s and 2010s were generally better times for appreciation than the 2000s. And just like with everything else we've covered today, adding leverage to that situation only exaggerates the effects even more than usual. Put another way, the returns that John would have received from his investments are more dependent on him being lucky enough to start investing on the right day than they would be without leverage. Using our 10-year rolling average returns as a measuring stick, we know that, before expenses, fees, and other adjustments, John's average return for a hypothetical, error-free, two-times ETF tracking the S&P 500 would have been roughly 10.5% per year. However, had John begun investing in April 1930, his results would have been very different. Even though he would have missed the beginnings of the Great Depression, he still would have lost approximately 28% per year on average for the next 10 years. And his nest egg would have been worth less than a tenth of what it was when he initially invested it. And on the other end of the extreme, had John begun investing in September 1990, he would have averaged returns of 34% per year over that 10-year span. This brings us to our second consideration for this category, the investor's time horizon. Because what this wide range of returns, even over several years, suggests is a very, very high start date sensitivity, which is generally not desirable for investors. And when we look at the data, that is what we see. An error-free, two-times leveraged S&P 500 fund would have had a total start date sensitivity of 93%. This figure comes from looking at each date within our time frame, in this case from 1928 through September 2020, and comparing the preceding 10-year returns with the following 10-year returns to see how big of a difference there is between the two. We then add together the largest overperforming and underperforming decades to get our total start date sensitivity. In this case, the largest overperforming decade started in May 1939 and went through May 1949. During those 10 years, the leveraged fund would have averaged returns of 32%, easily beating out its own returns from 1929 to 1939 of negative 26% per year for an overperformance of 58%. The largest underperforming decade was obviously the 2000s, when the returns failed to keep pace with what we saw in the 1990s by a margin of 35% per year. But beyond start date sensitivity, there's also the severity and length of market crashes to consider. Many long-term investors may be in a position where they can afford to wait out a market crash for a few years, so the regular ups and downs of your normal index fund are not a deal breaker. But when leverage is thrown in the equation, things can get a bit out of hand. By my count, since 1928, there would have been 16 unique crashes that John would have experienced with his hypothetical error-free leveraged ETF. On average, they would have lasted a little over four and a half years, which is long, but all in all, may not actually be an outright deal breaker for him if he's a long-term investor. But the worst of the crashes would have been pretty brutal. For instance, during the Great Depression, John's investments would have fallen by as much as 98.8% at their worst. Granted, if we had data on leveraged ETFs going back that far, we could add in realistic dividends, which would have mitigated some of that drop, but it's still worth noting. And the fund wouldn't have fully recovered for a full 34 years and 4 months. That probably is a deal breaker for quite a few investors. I don't know many people who are capable of seeing their investments fall by 90% or more and stay around that level for a couple of decades, which is more or less what happened in this case, without doing something about it. And I don't know many investors who'd be willing to wait for nearly their entire working career for their investments to break even either, especially considering that we're not taking inflation into account here. If we were, that recovery period would have been even longer. And of course, that wasn't the only crash to last over a decade. Obviously, the crashes of the 2000s also took quite a while to recover from for the hypothetical leveraged ETF. Nearly 15 years in this case. But beyond the severity and length of market crashes, there's also the amount of time you spent in crash or correction territory to take into consideration. Because even if the markets aren't dropping, if your investments seem to always be hovering around 10 or 20% below their highs, that can get a little demoralizing after a while. In this sample, our hypothetical error-free leveraged ETF would have spent roughly three quarters of its days in correction territory, meaning at least 10% below its all-time highs. It would have spent about 64% of its time in crash territory, meaning at least 20% below its all-time highs. Compare that to the 54% and 39% marks set by the S&P 500 index we're tracking, and you can see there's quite a difference. Lastly, we always want to consider our goals when choosing investments. Are we looking simply to maximize our returns, 
Or do we also care, at least a little bit, about things like the day-to-day -day volatility of the investment and how likely it is to give us the returns that are at least somewhat within the same ballpark of what the historical averages would imply? If we do just care about maximizing returns to the exclusion of all else, then we need to look at all the factors that influence what our returns will ultimately be. So far in this video, we've been comparing leveraged ETFs to unleveraged index funds without considering things like the impacts of expense ratios, which tend to be higher for leveraged ETFs, dividends, which tend to be lower for leveraged ETFs, taxes, which looking at history are not always higher with leveraged ETFs, but there is a difference between the two and it's not usually going to be in the leveraged fund's favor. Of course, depending on the account you're investing in, this may or may not be applicable to the investor in question, and of course, any other fees that we've discussed today. With that being said, if we added in things like expense ratios and dividend yields, I'm ignoring taxes and the other fees as they'd be almost impossible to model given the limited amount of information we have and how often things have changed in the investing industry over the years, how would the figures we've been discussing so far change? Well, let's look at Vanguard's S&P 500 Index Fund, ticker symbol VOO, and ProShare's ultra-leveraged S&P 500 Fund, ticker symbol SSO, to at least get a guesstimate of the impact of those differences. Without considering expenses or dividends, an error-free two-times leveraged fund had an estimated 10-year rolling return of about 10.5%. An unleveraged fund had rolling returns of about 6.6% per year under those same conditions. That's a difference of around 3.9% per year between the two funds. However, at least at the time of this writing, Vanguard's expense ratio and dividend yields for their S&P 500 fund is 0.03% and 1.74% respectively. The figures for ProShare's leveraged fund are 0.91% and 0.32% in those categories. That means that John's total returns are going to increase by roughly 1.7% per year, assuming he reinvested his dividends with the Vanguard fund after expenses are taken into account, while his total returns would actually fall by roughly 0.6% per year after expenses and dividends are taken into account with the ProShares leveraged fund. Now that doesn't completely close the gap between the two funds, the leveraged fund would still have returns of roughly 9.9% per year in this hypothetical, compared to the Vanguard fund's return of around 8.3% per year, but it does narrow the gap. At that point, John would have to ask himself, is the extra 1.6% per year in returns worth all the increased volatility, the longer and deeper crashes, and the uncertainty surrounding how close his actual returns in the future will mirror those of the past? It's entirely possible that for John, the answer is yes. For all we know, John is just using his fund money to invest in these leveraged funds, and he wouldn't care if they fell all the way to zero, which can happen in a leveraged fund even if the index it's tracking doesn't fall quite that far. I mean, if you're doubling or tripling the returns of the index and the index falls by 50% or 33% in a day, you do get completely wiped out. But I know that at least for me, personally, those relatively slim and unbelievably uncertain return advantages are not nearly enough to entice me to invest in a leveraged ETF over the long term. It's just not what they were created to do, even if there are instances in history where they likely would have succeeded. Personally, I'd much rather focus on optimizing my budget to be able to save a little bit more money and increase my net worth that way. But what do you think about it? Are leveraged ETFs viable long-term investments? Let me know in the comments section below. But that'll do it for me today. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button if you haven't already, subscribe, and hit that bell next to my name so you'll be notified of all my future uploads. I generally upload every single Monday, and if you have a friend that would be interested in this kind of content, be sure to share it with them. Let's really get this information out there and start our own financial revolution.